Hey everyone, um, so it is eight o'clock. Uh, so we're gonna get this session started. This is session three. Um, and so thank you all for getting out here bright and early for our, our 8 a.m. start. And so for uh, this session, um, sort of in contrast to what uh, uh, was covered yesterday, which was focusing on sugars, we're switching gears a little bit. And um, session three is all about artificial sweeteners or non-nutritive sweeteners or low-calorie sweeteners. Um, however you wish to call it, those names will be seeing that they're used interchangeably, but all um, meaning the, the, same, the same idea. And so, um, again, thank you to the organizers for um, organizing this exciting session. We have uh, great speakers lined up. And so we're going to start with our first one, uh, Richard Mattis, uh, who's going to be talking about low-calorie sweeteners and body weight. I think something that we're all very, very interested in, um, based on the fact that this came up <laughs> quite a bit yesterday as well. And so um, Dr. Mattis comes to us from Purdue, Purdue University, and he's done a great deal of work in this area. And I still, to this day, quote his, <laughs> that his paper comparing jelly beans to um, liquid sugar in every sugar-sweetened beverage paper I write. So it's a, <laughs> it's a great honor to have him here with us today. Thank you. morning and thank you very much and uh, I'll pick up uh, on, on actually the the issue of what are we going to call these things uh, yeah, the, the title that was assigned to me was artificial sweeteners and, and body weight uh, so we can't really call there, there is no perfect term we can't really call them artificial because stevia is not artificial we can't call them non-nutritive because aspartame is perfectly nutritive um, uh, so, so we're, we're, we're kind of at a bind, and I, we don't want to call them high intensity because nothing is actually sweeter than 8 to 10 percent sucrose. Um, so there is no perfect term, but we had a conference actually, uh, uh, what, two years ago uh, on this topic, and we sort of polled everybody what they thought the best terminology would be, and, and they came up with, and it wasn't my first choice actually, but I'm willing to go with the consensus. Uh, the low calorie sweetener. Uh, and I think it would be good for the field to finally agree on some common terminology. And the reason they resonated to that is it conveys the functional property to consumers probably most clearly. Um, so in the absence of any that's really logically the right one, this is the one we're, we're sort of pushing consensus towards. All right. So Humans seem to have um, a particular uh, draw to white crystalline substances. And uh, some of these um, are uh, viewed uniformly as potentially dangerous. Uh, others are more controversial. Uh, though there are people that would, I think honestly, argue for the equivalence of, of all of these compounds in terms of their adverse effects on health. And, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's in part uh, driven by, by a very strong uh, agenda. And I want to just start off with an example of how uh, we have to be careful about how we interpret data that's, that's published and um, sort of try to control the messaging that goes out. So, uh, these are two studies that uh, actually are still among the largest uh, in the field and still get cited in meta-analyses and so on, uh, but, but make this point. So uh, this was a trial uh, conducted by the American Cancer Society, and, and it was a survey for other purposes, uh, but they just happened to ask the respondents uh, whether or not they used low-calorie sweeteners and whether or not in the year prior to the survey they had gained weight, lost weight, or maintained their body weight. So two-thirds of the participants said that there was no change or they had actually lost weight, but among those who gained weight, uh, there was, at every weight level, a small incremental greater weight gain for those that said they used low-calorie sweeteners compared to those who said they didn't. So the media picked up on this and said, this proves low-calorie sweeteners cause weight gain, right? And unfortunately, some clinicians and fellow researchers also 
came up with that interpretation. And so it got a lot of play uh, in the media. Uh, okay. Uh, and then on the other side of the story, we have uh, a trial conducted by George Blackburn, uh, Blackburn here, uh, looking at the efficacy of aspartame for weight loss. And uh, this, there was a 19-week intervention, and uh, I think you can see pretty clearly that the aspartame was not superior to the control uh, condition for the active intervention period. But in the follow-up period, uh, you can see that those that were assigned to the low-calorie sweetener, the aspartame, they regained less weight than the participants that weren't assigned to the aspartame treatment. And so the interpretation given to this was that aspartame is effective for weight loss, uh, right? And, and so depending on where you want to focus here, you could draw either conclusion that, that you wish, but, but the, the take on this was that it... Uh, was an effective agent for weight loss. Interestingly enough, neither of the authors came to those conclusions. Both of them uh, said, uh, and these are quotes from the papers, that the effects were, were null, that there was no effect of, of either of these treatments on, on the outcomes that they measured. Uh, but it's an example of how uh, uh, spin develops on, on a story and, and takes off and creates its own story. And, and I think we really have to be careful because this is a very highly charged uh, field. So where are we now? There, there are two principal areas, I think, that uh, are of concern among consumers and, and the healthcare community, and, and they focus on both safety and efficacy. Now, in terms of safety, there, there's some pretty good reason to be concerned about some of these, uh, some low-calorie sweeteners. So the first one, arguably uh, ever identified, developed, uh, was by the Romans, all right? So they learned that if you boiled uh, grape juice down in leaded pots, uh, that it created a syrup called uh, defrutum or sapa, uh, and that they could take this syrup and add it to other foods, add no calories, but uh, make them quite sweet. The, the, the problem is that what happened when they were boiling down the, the grape juice is the acetic acid was converted to acetate, and that bound to the lead in the pots that it was cooked in, and so the sweetener was actually lead acetate, uh, which probably isn't a good thing to be drinking in, in large quantities. Um, but after that, the, the modern era of uh, low-calorie sweeteners uh, uh, starts really with aspartame. So in 1879, Fallberg uh, uh, accidentally discovered uh, saccharin, um, and uh, immediately that led to, to considerable controversy as well. So Harvey Wiley, who was Fallberg's mentor, Johns Hopkins, um, uh, tried to get it banned right off the bat because it was the product of coal tar. It was, it was accidentally discovered in, in the studies looking at derivatives of coal tars. And he said anything that comes from coal tar couldn't possibly be good for human health. And so he petitioned, uh, he, Harvey Wiley, of course, is the, the person who started the FDA, and he tried to get it banned, and he went to Roosevelt, who was president at the time, and was shut down right off the bat because Roosevelt famously is quoted as, as saying, anybody who thinks that saccharin is injurious to health is an idiot. Some rhetoric, rhetoric we, we, we kind of have become familiar with, huh? Um, um, and and um, uh, Roosevelt was actually prescribed saccharin by his physician to control his own weight. Uh, so he had a, a, a vested interest in keeping it legal. Um, but suffice it to say that all of these compounds now uh, have been really scrutinized by the FDA, by the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, uh, and similar gov governmental bodies in, in Canada, Australia, Japan, and, and around the world, and uniformly have been found to be safe toxicologically um, when used uh, in, in moderation. So uh, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about safety. Let's move on to, to efficacy, which is really, I think, of more interest here. So this has been summarized in, in three uh, relatively recent meta-analyses. I'm not a great fan of meta-analyses, uh, but that's a, it's a convenient way to summarize a lot of data in a short amount of time in a talk. Uh, so the first was uh, this trial by uh, Miller and Perez. 
uh, and they divided the, the studies into cohort studies and randomized controlled trials. And in their analysis of the cohort studies, they found that there was a very small but statistically significant positive association uh, between uh, use of low calorie sweeteners and BMI. It was not significant uh, when they looked at body weight uh, and, and use of low calorie sweeteners. So uh, sort of an equivocal finding in, in this cohort study. Uh, but when they looked at the randomized control trials, uh, they found that uh, BMI was positively associated, how do I re rephrase this? It was associated with weight loss uh, rather than weight gain. Um, and that was true for fat mass as well, as well as uh, waist circumference. So the evidence based on what most of us consider higher order science, the randomized controlled trials rather than the, uh, the cohort studies, shows beneficial effects of use of low calorie sweeteners. So this was followed a year later by a larger uh, meta-analysis by Peter Rogers and, and others in Europe. Uh, and they looked again at cohort studies versus RCTs. And in their analysis of cohort studies, they found no effect of uh, low calorie, uh, not low, um, yeah, low calorie sweetener use uh, in either adults or in children, uh, but they replicated the beneficial effects 